come to order. There we go. It's now our honor to introduce our second panel witness, the Honorable Douglas Schuman, who is the Commissioner of the IRS, a post that he has held since he was appointed under President, Obama, uh, President Bush nearly five years ago. Welcome. Pursuant to our committees, I would ask you to rise and take the oath. And raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Let the record uh, indicate that the gentleman has answered in the affirmative. Please have a seat. Uh, as I noted during the first panel, you, uh, you did a great job of, uh, of staying focused on what was going here from the back. You have obviously done this uh, many times before. Uh, since you are the only witness, we won't hold you strictly to the five minutes, but I would ask you to remember that your entire written statement is in the record. And with that, the gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you for having me here. Um, thank you, uh, Ranking Member Cummings and other members of, of the committee. Um, immediately upon enactment, of the Affordable Care Act, or ACA, uh, we began our implementation efforts, which included both executing on the short-term provisions that were in the bill that were our responsibilities, as well as putting a structure and process in place to plan for provisions with future effective dates. Um, the IRS moved very quickly on some of the law that became effective uh, immediately. For example, we conducted outreach and implementation uh, for the Small Business Health Care Tax Credit. Uh, the ACA, as you know, also expanded the adoption credit immediately and provided favorable tax treatment for adult children up to age 26 who are covered by their parents' insurance. The IRS's most substantial implementation effort relates to the to the delivery of hundreds of billions of dollars in premium assistance tax credits that will help millions of American families afford health insurance starting in 2014. Now, the Department of Health and Human Services is the lead agency in defining the structure and operations of health insurance exchanges, with the Treasury and the IRS defining the associated rules for how the tax credits can help subsidize coverage. It is important to note that the credit will be paid directly to the insurance company, which is a major design feature which should help mitigate the risk of fraudulent claims. Taxpayers will then reconcile the advance payments they receive on their tax return. If the credit is larger than the sum of the advance payments, the taxpayer will be entitled to a refund. If the credit is smaller than the sum of the advance payments, the taxpayer will owe the difference. Now, starting in 2014, individuals who can afford health insurance coverage and are not eligible for an exemption must either purchase minimum essential coverage or make a payment with their tax return. The payment only applies to taxpayers who can afford insurance but do not purchase it. We are already working with tax return preparers and the tax software community to give taxpayers the tools that they will need to fill out their returns in 2015. The IRS process for verifying coverage will be very similar to the one we have used for years to verify wages and withholding. The IRS will match what is reported on the tax return with the information reported to insure, or by the insurers. For the small number of taxpayers who may appear to have underpaid and were not eligible for an exemption, we will generally follow up with written correspondence. I think it is important that I clarify one misconception. Revenue agents who are trained on much more complex tax issues do not work on resolving these kinds of issues. The law also clearly specifies that the IRS will not use levies or file notices of Federal tax liens if the taxpayer have unpaid amounts related to the individual coverage provision. Because these and other ACA provisions are substantial and require long-term planning, 
we immediately established processes within our business operations and our IT operations to make sure we could implement the law smoothly. Um, before closing, let me just observe that the IRS is continuing its long tradition of being a nonpartisan agency that implements the laws that Congress passes. As the Chairman mentioned, uh, I started my tenure in 2008, and right when I walked in the door, we were asked to, outside of the tax systems, figure out a way to send 100 million Americans stimulus checks, which the previous administration did as the recession started to hit. We also played a role in the Affordable Care Act, or I'm sorry, in the uh, Recovery Act. Um, during the serious economic downturn, we set up special programs we called Fresh Start to work with struggling taxpayers, and now we're working on the Affordable Care Act. Um, I believe the effort is going smoothly. Uh, I believe we have the proper plans in place. And all of this is a tribute to the dedicated professional men and women at the IRS who have devoted long careers to fair and even-handed administration of the nation's tax laws. Thank you. That ends my opening statement. Thank you. I recognize myself now. And I want to start off by thanking you and the men and women of the IRS. Uh, I note that uh, your job is a strenuous one, one that has a five-year term. I understand you are the third to have that term. Um, and it was intended to take away the partisan perception, and I think you have done a good job of that. But I do have some questions, perhaps not to so call it partisan, but maybe Pollyannish. Uh, you have done, the IRS has done an, a selective outreach uh, based on Obamacare or the ACA's benefits. You said it in your testimony. You sent out millions of postcards doing an outreach to educate people as to the law's benefit or tax credit to small businesses, correct? We did send out uh, tax credits. Did you send? Uh, do, uh, do you plan on sending postcards out to tell people about the tax increases? No. So you are only telling people, the IRS is only telling people about the good news and not telling them about tax increases. Aren't tax increases more something you need to know about in advance? for planning than windfalls of money. I grew up in a neighborhood where, you know, that windfall is kafina the gelt. It's found money. This isn't, this isn't what you need warning for. You don't need warning about good news. You need warning about tax increases, don't you? So we do extensive outreach um, on all tax provisions, and we have but started you're, but you're not to do But you are not it. sending any indication to small businesses about the tax increases they are going to see under Obamacare? We have done extensive outreach, and we do it you know, based nope. on um, looking at what is the best way to get the word out for different pieces. I think the, um, right now we are working with the preparer community and the business community to work through um, a, getting our systems in place in a, in a, in a way that works well, okay, getting, well, getting the interaction well, right. Well, speaking of the systems, under Obamacare Section 9002, you were required to deal with the W-2 forms, and yet you unilaterally delayed reporting requirements. In other words, this piece of bad news is not going out that otherwise would have made it clear that, again, tax increases, right? Uh, I think you are you referring to the uh, requirement that employers put, put, a, value, put a value of health insurance benefits on the W-2? How much they paid right. um, for, for their health insurance, yeah. No, we actually delayed uh, the reporting requirement at the request of our information reporting uh, uh, committee that works with us regularly because they couldn't get their systems ready. They couldn't get their systems ready. We we had a lot of feedback from the business community. Well, let's go through that. There's paychecks and uh, what's the other big one? Uh, ADP. ADP. They both got it ready. They're both able to do it. So um, I'm trying to understand. This this was something that uh, that I think many people who want folks to understand. This is sort of the bad news again. This is letting people know how much is already being paid in. Uh, the question is, where did you get the authority to unilaterally delay? So you are saying it is based on not being ready, and yet the vast majority of these things would have, uh, you know, you could have allowed a waiver and yet still implemented for those who were ready. And if someone was using paychecks or ADP, they would have been ready and it would have happened, right? Um, that is not my understanding. So um, my understanding is that um, this reporting, which I, I guess I am confused about it being bad news, this is just saying how much your current employer 
pays for your health insurance. Um, well, most Americans have no idea that, that health care costs as much as it does. This, was, this provision was one that I think Republicans wanted genuinely in there so people would understand just how expensive it is, how much is already being paid for. Um, having over the years had employees who left who were shocked when they had to pay their COBRA and they wanted to know what was wrong, and the answer was, well, we were paying 90 percent of it. Now you see what, what was not tax, you know, not, you're not seeing from a tax standpoint. Let me go through just one or two more questions. Uh, You said that, uh, that the IRS would not be essentially dunning people who owed under the mandate, but is there anything that would prohibit you from uh, assuming that the first $1,000 owed under the mandate penalty, which now is assessed to be a tax by our U.S. Supreme Court, uh, and let's just say they refuse to pay it, is there anything that keeps you from considering that dollar one of, of taxable uh, requirements and thus having the last dollar uh, be owed? In other words, if if I, have, if I pay in $10,000 and I owe $9,000 or $8,000 and you simply uh, make the assumption the first $1,000 added is this tax that they didn't pay, is there any reason you wouldn't take it all and done them for revenues owed? Is there anything that stops you from doing it? Let me try to answer the question. I'm not sure I understand it. Um, if I don't pay my taxes, isn't it possible you could treat the $1,000 mandated penalty like any other tax and done me for it with penalty and interest? Um, so if you don't pay that, um, what we would do is send out a letter. Um, most, you know, as you know, most people pay the taxes they owe on time. Um, we'd but send, this is, we'd this is a tax that is not collected through withholding. If you assessed it as the first part of withholding, took it out of withholding, and then just simply done me for being in arrears on my overall taxes, you could treat it as long as there was $1,000 of withholding, you take it, take it for this and then treat it as though I didn't have sufficient withholding. Couldn't you deal with that? So we would treat it as, um, you know, a penalty on your return. Um, the uh, statute is clear, and it's the only place the statute is clear, that we can't do a, a lien or a levy, which is very rare, which we do way down um, the line. But, but Beyond I want, that, it would be part of your, your federal but, tax. But, and I, I want to get this very clear. Okay, and, and I apologize for running over, but you haven't gotten the answer to the actual question, so let me be clear on the question. If I owe $10,000 in normal taxes on income, right. at the end, and I have this $1,000 penalty, if you put the $1,000 penalty at the end, then you don't have the ability to levy or lien. However, if you simply collect it as the first $1,000 on my withholding, take it out, I now have a shortage, a shortfall in my withholding. So now you're not levying against the penalty; you're levying against ordinary taxes you've already collected on the front end. There's nothing that stops you from taking that as the first dollar and then levying on the last dollar against income tax. I guess I, I apologize. I want to be responsive. I really um, it'll be part of your overall liability if there's a thousand dollars owed. There will be a $1,000 carve-out that there could never be a lien on. Um, I'm confused well, about the withholding. And, and I'm going to yield to the ranking member, uh, but there clearly was a statement, no question at all, Federal exchanges were not covered in this law and the letter of the law, and yet you've had a rulemaking that covers it, covers it without legislative action, but rather based on some loose in, in, intent. The fact that we said that there's no levy. All you would have to do is collect this money off of the first $1,000 of withholding, and then the shortfall would actually be on other funds you could levy. Any creative accountant could come up with it. I am going to assume that the IRS will do so based on what your folks have chosen to do on something that was outside Obamacare's right, which was subsidizing the Federal exchanges. Mr. Ranking Member, uh, I would ask unanimous consent. You have an additional three minutes, so if you will tally eight minutes, I yield to the gentleman. Thank you very much, <coughs> Mr. Uh, Commissioner Schumann. Uh, I want to, uh, I hope that IRS employees are watching this, and I want to say to them publicly, thank you, and I thank you. Um, and let me tell you what I am thanking you for. I, you know, as I listened to the last panel, um, you know, I listened to Mr. Everson, and he, I'm, you heard it, it, most of his testimony, did you not? I, I did hear some. Yeah, and he talked a lot about his concerns 
and basically um, all but said it can't be done. And I got to tell you that as one who uh, uh, rose up from poverty to the Congress of the United States of America, I know that this country, we can do anything we try hard enough to do. I know that. My, my own life has told me that. And when you started off your testimony today to talk about what you all have done already and what you did, um, I think you started back in 2008, you said you had to come in and do certain things. Um, I just like the can-do attitude because um, certainly if we stick with the naysayers, I guess we won't get anything done. But the fact is, is that what the people at IRS are doing in trying to make sure the law works properly um, will go a long ways towards um, helping a lot of people. And I'm talking about, and I say this over and over again because I mean it, I'm talking about people at IRS will end up helping people save their lives and save a lot of pain. And so I want to thank you all publicly for that can-do attitude. I know you get, I know IRS get a, a lot of bad comments. Matter of fact, government employees get a lot of bad comments. But when I hear things like what you just said, it just, in my mother's words, who's a former sharecropper, it just makes my heart glad. Commissioner Schumann, in the earlier panel, the committee heard from Nina Olson, the national taxpayer advocate. In her testimony, she explained that the IRS has made significant progress on rulemaking and other areas. Let me read from her testimony. She says, since ACA, the enactment of ACA, the IRS has been working through the major challenges making significant progress. The lead time provided by the ACA has been very helpful for the IRS. And at this point, it appears the IRS has used the time well, end of quote. Ms. Olson, uh, Ms. Olson is very complimentary about your efforts over the past uh, two years to ensure that the planning process is on track. Uh, I would like to know your perspective. How did, did you approach the planning process over the past two years, and how would you evaluate your own efforts to date? You know, well, the, the one thing, while, while the ACA is a substantial undertaking, the tax provisions for the IRS, um, you know, I come from a, a business background, and the one thing I'd say generally is that um, you know what you need is uh, proper planning, enough lead time, and proper resources to implement things. Um, in the in the world of tax, we've gotten used to, unfortunately, late legislation, retroactive legislation, and the one thing this law affords us is plenty of time to do implementation right. We had to scramble to get some of the things done, some of the things that the Chairman uh, referenced and we talked about. But the major pieces of the legislation where we um, have the most work to do, like setting up our infrastructure to make sure we distribute tax credits, the premium tax credits, in conjunction with the exchanges, um, you know, we had multiple years to do. And so, you know, I, you know, there's always room for improvement. Um, but I think our team, you know, both uh, our team who had to work um, to do the planning, do the immediate implementation, and then build the IT systems, you know, I think they're well on track and, and doing, you know, a good job. So I'd give them a pretty good grade. With yeah. that said, we've got to keep our eye on the ball. Um, and with any piece of tax legislation, we need to make sure that we, we take it through and implement it at the end. Well, I, well, I hope that they know the, that they have a lot of grateful people uh, who appreciate what they're doing. On the first panel, we heard a lot of concerns about data privacy, and that's, that's a concern of, of mine's. And I know the IRS actually has a great record on protecting taxpayers' information. I, you may have heard some of that testimony. Commissioner Schumann, what steps has the agency taken to ensure the security of taxpayer information going forward? And do you think that the steps that you are, have taken uh, will be sufficient? Uh, and what additional steps do you see uh, being necessary? Um, so uh, let me say a couple things. First of all, this agency takes data security very, very seriously. Um, and we have an excellent track record of protecting American uh, taxpayers' basic income data. Second, um, I would just say there's been a lot of, both in the previous panel and also you know, out there in the general uh, dialogue, I think 
way overstatements of the risk of data security. I mean, this is not something wildly new to us. Right now, um, we share data um, with states for child support information, with states for Medicaid, with states for um, tax information, and we have very strict safeguards around that data. Um, in this case, any data we exchange with states, they have to have written procedures in place that we will look at. Um, they have to agree to separate the data. They have to agree to have limited use of the data just for the purposes of the law. Um, they need to train their people. We have an Office of Data uh, Privacy and Security that will go out and do audits to make sure it's, it's right. And the federal law uh, takes tax data very seriously, and individual employees can be prosecuted for breaching tax data. That individual liability extends out to anyone we send data to. And so this is nothing new for us. Um, obviously, it's an effort, and we're going to have to do it. But I think the concerns about data security around this um, are overstated. You sound like you, you take a lot of pride in IRS's uh, uh, efforts to keep secure, to keep uh, the privacy of uh, Americans. Uh, tax information uh, private. You seem very proud of that. Are you? Um, well, A, I'm very proud of it. B, it's a cornerstone of the tax system. C, we've done it a lot with ch exchanging with states and we haven't had major issues. Um, you know, I'll tell you a little story. I, my first day, I showed up at the job. I went to the Treasury Department and was sworn in by the Treasury Secretary. Um, I came back and the person waiting for me was the um, lawyer to explain the data privacy rules and the people who did the training for me. And so, I mean, that's how seriously the agency takes this. They didn't go brief me on our technology or our filing season, et cetera. The first thing I was briefed on was data security. My last question. Ms. Olson uh, spent a lot of time talking about the challenge uh, for IRS with regard to communications, our communication strategy, taxpayer education about these new rules. Uh, do you agree that taxpayer education is essential to the success of the implementation? And can you please explain how the IRS plans to educate the public about uh, these new rules? Um, well, so there's, there's a few things. One is um, any time a tax law is passed, we do a, a variety of things. We use social media to get information out. Sometimes we do direct communication. Eighty percent of taxpayers, and it's up, it's growing. It lasts tax season was actually over 85 percent, use either a paid professional preparer or tax software. And so a lot of the details of these rules, just like the details of the rest of people's tax forms, get sorted out either when they are figuring out uh, how to file or get sorted out you know, with, their, with their preparer. So we do a lot of work um, with them. And we, ex we ex expect to expand uh, our outreach. I will also note that um, because this issue has gotten, uh, the Affordable Care Act has gotten so much attention by the media, um, you know, this is not something people are unaware of, and we're trying hard just to get the actual facts out, um, and we'll keep, keep that campaign up. I thank the ranking, ranking member. Uh, the Chair will now recognize himself for five minutes. Uh, Mr. Shulman, thank you so much for being here today because certainly we have uh, several things we would like to clear up in regards to the initial drafting of the Affordable Care Act and the subsequent ruling by the IRS. Uh, I think uh, you were listening to the first panel and clearly there are some disagreements between Professor Jost and Mr. Cannon on uh, whether or not the IRS uh, ruling was illegal. And, uh, why, why do you think, first of all, uh, I think that the intent when the law was written, it was clear that uh, the administration and the authors of the bill assumed that the states would set up exchanges. It, it certainly, it was clearly mentioned numerous times throughout uh, the language of the bill, and there was uh, not mention of the federal exchanges. I think, uh, one, the, the health care law people were very leery of. I think 63 percent opposed this law. Uh, when it, it was first uh, presented or even passed. And uh, I, I think Senator Baucus from Montana clearly wanted a national exchange, but I think the American people resoundingly rejected the thought of a national takeover of health care. 
So the language was carefully crafted in the bill to mention State exchanges, because State exchanges sounded much more palatable to people than a Federal takeover of health care. So uh, were you a little shocked, I guess, when uh, I think there's only 14 States now that have decided to set up State exchanges? Was that kind of a surprise to you and something you hadn't anticipated? Um, I guess I didn't follow, um, you know, uh, the before and after as, as closely as that, so I had no reaction. I'm watching how this goes. I mean, our main job is to try to implement the law sure. uh, that was written. Oh, fair enough. Uh, do you agree that when authorizing these premium assistant tax credits, the Internal Revenue Code, Section 36B, explicitly refers to health insurance exchanges established by the States under Section, section 1311? Um, I think 36B has some contradictory language in it. Well, we can put up I a mean, slide. Uh, is there anything unclear about that? Is there anything unclear? Does it mention, does it mention Federal exchanges anywhere in that section? Um, I'm looking at the slide, but I'm also aware of the whole statute, so I guess I'd... Okay. Um, Do you recall it, it mentioning Federal exchanges? Excuse me? Do you, do you, are you aware that it... Does it mention Federal exchanges or just State exchanges? Anywhere in 36B, yes. In, in uh, 1311. That's the slide. Um, or, or, or that's not the slide. We have another slide. But. Uh, I guess I watched the first panel and would agree that there's a lot of disagreement. And we obviously you know, looked at the total statute and, and think we came to the correct legal reading. Okay. The plain meaning of the Rule 36B uh, it is possible that the Court could read the phrase, an exchange established by the State under 1311 of ACA. Uh, th this was the CRS ruling that uh, the gentlelady from New York uh, referred to in the first uh, panel. Uh, it said that, as, that the uh, exchange could be clear to not include an exchange establishment by the Federal Government. Indeed, the language seems to be st straightforward on its face. Uh, are, are you aware of that CRS ruling? I'm not aware of that. Okay. Well, let's. Uh, do you agree that uh, when authorizing those tax credits, the IRS or the IRC re repeatedly refers to exchanges established by the state under Section 1311? I guess I'm. I'm not aware of the. Uh, okay. Well, it, it does uh, repeatedly. Why did the IRS add the phrase or in 1321 in the rule? Uh, do you believe this is a dramatic interpretation that, in essence, rewrites the law? No. Why do you say that? Um, maybe it would be helpful for you to hear how our uh, rule writing process works. I mean, our, our legal experts, career civil servants who are some of the best uh, tax lawyers in the world, if not the best, take a look at statutes, um, look at the entirety of the statute and try to come up with their best legal analysis. Okay. Well, basically, we are set to scramble because this bill was set to be passed and go to conference. And it did not go to conference, but rather reconciliation because the votes simply weren't there to pass the law. Scott Brown was elected and he was on his way in. So they had to rush this law. They knew it was imperfect. They knew that they couldn't force the states to set up exchanges. The, 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 power, the Federal Government doesn't have the power to force the States to do it, so they had to try, in essence, to coerce the States, in a sense, to set up these exchanges. And they didn't mention Federal state, uh, exchanges on purpose because they wanted the States to do this. They wanted to kind of strong-arm the States to set up these exchanges. And they knew that they had to put out a bill with this language that was imperfect because if they didn't do it before the end of the year and they did it on Christmas Eve, then they were going to have to deal with probably not passing the law at all. And so now you were tasked with basically cleaning up their mess, cleaning up their language, because it clearly wasn't in the bill. They referred to state-run exchanges repeatedly and left out uh, the Federal exchanges, even in the reconciliation process. It, it simply wasn't in there. So I think Mr. Cannon, you know, his point is that the IRS way overstepped its bounds uh, of separation of power, in e essence, wrote a huge tax increase, trillion dollar tax increase that Congress did not intend, but th this mess was created when the states didn't fall in line and set up the exchanges. Isn't that true? No. Why do you say it's not true? It clearly is. Um, I just disagree with Mr. Cannon. Um, I think that uh, this was the correct 
reading of the law. Um, I have no idea what the reference is to a tax increase, um, but we are not concerned with that. Our okay, job you, you understand the statute. Does the statute ever say that tax credits are available in Federal exchanges? Does it ever say that? Um, there are sections of the statute that directly talk about a federally run exchange Can you getting tell me information where? to the IRS. Um, in Section 1401, which is the same as 36B, there is reference about information reporting of premium tax credits to the IRS from the federal exchange. And so, I, look, I, I fully understand that you have got a view on this and that we disagree. I think the law professors before uh, and the panel before fleshed out the arguments on both sides. Um, our legal experts came down uh, on the side that we, that we came out with. Well, I mean, yeah, I, I clearly disagree with you because uh, we know what the intent was. We know why this all uh, came about. And uh, I, I don't think the argument was clearly um, refuted. In fact, uh, Professor Jost in several cases rescinded. First, he wanted to call it a drafting error, a Scribner's error. He retracted all those statements because they are scrambling to find a reason to justify what the IRS did. And, uh, you know, clearly, uh, you know, th this issue is far from over. The, uh, the companies in the States without State-run exchanges are going to challenge the IRS rule, and this will probably end up in Federal court. I don't think there is any question about if. It is just a matter of when. So I see my time has expired, and I and, will uh, yield uh, to the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Davis. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Commissioner. You know, there are a lot of assertions that people make and have made, and they have said that this is in the legislation, this is in the bill, it is going to cause people to do this and cause people to do that. And then when you look, you can't find what they are basing their assumptions on. I know that some opponents of the legislation have claimed that to implement this, that the Internal Revenue Service has got to hire 16,000 new agents, enforcement agents. And you have said on numerous occasions that this is a made-up number with no basis in fact. As a matter of fact, some people have even compared the Internal Revenue Service to the Gestapo, as Mr. Everson pointed out in his testimony on the first panel, which is not only inaccurate but, quite frankly, unconscionable, way beyond the pale, I think. Um, do you agree that, that this type of non-information or misinformation is damaging to the image of the agency? And is it true that you are going to have to hire all of these people to enforce provisions of the Act? Um, so we have been incredibly transparent in what we need to implement this law. Um, we put forward budgets um, and have sent to Congress the last uh, three years of information, and then we put, we put forward a budget this year. Um, the budget we put forward this year, uh, 92 percent of it is for infrastructure and technology to make sure um, that the Act is executed. Um, and so, uh, you know, referring to this number of 16,000 agents, I have no idea where anyone got that. Um, that is not going to happen. And as I said, the major parts of this law are going to be handled, the um, compliance aspects through correspondence. Um, you know, regarding unfortunate remarks about the IRS, all I would say is um, we have a very good track record um, of interacting with the American people in incredibly respectful ways. Um, right now, uh, the American Customer Satisfaction Index, which is run by the University of Michigan, which um, looks at you know, major companies across the globe as well as um, government agencies. We have our highest rating ever at 73. Um, most people who interact with us uh, send in a refund return, 
and within five to ten days get $3,000 back from us. So while I know that the words IRS sometimes conjure up things that people can make scary, the reality is, for most people, we're a great service organization. So um, yes, it's unhelpful for people to you know, use uh, rhetoric, but I think our record stands for itself. And when you ask American citizens one by one in things like the American Customer Satisfaction Index, we get very high ratings. There are also individuals who use this invasion of privacy. It's very interesting who some of them are. They are not people that I have known to be protecting the privacy of individual citizens in a lot of other instances and a lot of other ways. But they claim that the Internal Revenue Service is going to have access to individuals' private health information. Is, is that a need in order to enforce the provisions of the Act? No, absolutely not. I mean, what we will know is, um, and, and ask for, based on the law, is um, do you have health insurance coverage? If so, for how many months? And what was the name of the insurance company? Um, right now, um, we get information about what is your income, who is your employer, how long were you employed? Um, do you own a house? Did you sell a house? Was there interest on this house? Um, do you have stocks or bonds? Did you buy them or sell them? What it is? And so we get lots of information, but we get the bare bones that we need to file a tax return. Um, I think it has been way overstated our role in health care. I mean, we are basically going to facilitate the financial transactions that make this whole uh, law work, but we are not going to have access to private individual health care information except for the fact of coverage. Do you see individuals being uh, locked up, incarcerated, uh, liens placed on their homes or their properties or whatever it is that they might own in order to make sure that there is com compliance? I mean, the, the minimum coverage provisions which say that um, you either need to have insurance or you pay a penalty, those specifically prohibit liens, levies, criminal prosecution, and so they are treated very different than other liabilities owed to the, to the Federal Government. So then many of these assertions are quite honestly uh, inaccurate. Well, some of, the ones, some of the ones you brought up, yes. Well, thank you very much. My time is expiring. And, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I thank the gentleman. I think it uh, means we have a uh, small day as today. I think we can go through a second round of questioning, uh, if you will indulge us. Uh, can you describe the universe of people who will be subject to the new HHS reporting requirements? Uh, we understand that it is expected that 20 million people will fall under these requirements. Is that correct? I am sorry. The, the, which requirements? The uh, HHS reporting requirements. I am not sure what the HHS reporting requirements are or what you are referring to. Okay. okay. Well, under the HHS rules, isn't it true that for these Americans they will now be required to tell the State and the IRS when they change jobs within 30 days of the change? Um, I think you um, I think you're referring to the people who receive a premium tax credit? Okay. Uh, isn't it true? Yeah, yes, you are. You are referring to that. Thank you. Okay. So um, the, the way the premium tax credit works is people go to an exchange. Um, if they have not been offered affordable uh, health care coverage by their employer, they may be eligible for uh, a tax credit to help subsidize um, the purchase of insurance. Um, and that is based on a, a number of factors, including their income. Um, if their income changes, they have an obligation to come back and say that the income changes so that the amount of the credit can be adjusted. Okay. And that is within 30 days? Um, I am I, really not aware of the, the details of when, when that reporting back to the exchanges are, because that is not a piece of the, of, of the Act that we will be administering. That, that falls with, as you said, HHS and the exchanges. Okay. 
if, if they don't report the change, assuming it is 30 days in the window, what are the consequences uh, and how do you plan to enforce the rule? Um, so the way the premium tax credit works, which I referred to in my, my opening comments, is um, people go to the exchange, um, they determine the eligibility for a credit and the amount of the credit. Um, they receive the credit um, in advance payment, and that payment is made directly to the insurance company. And then there is a true-up procedure um, when they file a tax return, much like a true-up of estimated taxes or a true-up of your withholding. Um, and the way that it works is if they got too much of a credit up front, they will owe some money back. If they got not enough, the Federal Government will owe them to true up. So there is a true up procedure um, that will be administered on the back end. According to your July 2010 report, the uh, IRS has fallen short of providing adequate taxpayer service in important areas. Given the massive scope of Obamacare, is it likely the IRS customer service is going to get worse rather than better? Um, I am not sure what the July 10 report is, but um, the taxpayer advocate report. That is from the taxpayer advocate who independently reports uh, to, com to, to Congress. Okay. Okay. Well, the, the question still uh, stands about customer service. How do you anticipate that is going to be handled? Um, you know, we have had a, uh, what I think is a very good uh, track record of customer service um, with the resources we have been given, and I expect uh, us to continue to deliver good customer service. So an hour plus wait, in your opinion, is good customer service when people actually need to talk to somebody who knows something about an issue? We don't have an hour plus wait on average. What, 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 you, what would you say the wait is? Um, it depends when you call. Um, you know, the wait can be as short as someone picks up immediately and there is no wait, and it can be a, a lot longer. If people call at peak times, we tell them how long their wait is and they call back. Uh, from, okay, from the National Taxpayer Association. Uh, for calls that require issues of expertise, the IRS track record is even worse. In March 2012, taxpayers calling IRS Tax Protection Unit only reached IRS 11 percent of the time after an average wait time of an hour and six minutes. Um, this was a very specialized line that had just been set up. It was understaffed at the very beginning. Once we became aware of the problems, we put new people on, and the year we have averaged uh, 90 percent. Okay. So that is a very short point in time, and when we see issues, we correct them. Okay. Well, I mean, I understand having pride in the, the agency that you oversee, but uh, you can look in the camera and tell all the Americans watching that you feel that the customer service uh, within the IRS agency is good. I can do it the other way around, which is, as I mentioned, the American Customer Satisfaction Index, which goes out and asks Americans how are their interactions with the IRS, is at its highest level ever at 73 percent. Well, that is not what the data says. And I think for the people watching, they can probably make up their own minds. They don't have to take my opinion or yours. But uh, um, my time has expired, and I would be happy to yield or to uh, recognize now the ranking member for five minutes. Thank you very much. Um, during one of our subcommittee's hearings, um, some business entities told us, uh, Commissioner, that they were not sure which rules will apply to them and how they will comply with new requirements. I understand that some of these rules are still in progress, such as the rule on how to calculate full-time equivalent employees. Has the IRS engaged with businesses to ensure that programs and regulations are responsive to their concerns? And number two, are there still misperceptions about IRS's role uh, in uh, implementing the health care uh, reform bill? Um, you know, to the second one, any time there is uh, you know, a major tax bill, um, we need to educate people. And frankly, until you start actually um, implementing, that is when people really focus their mind and understand. With that said, we have been having extensive dialogue with the business community uh, about the employer responsibility uh, provisions of the law that we need to uh, administer. Um, as you mentioned, there is a couple of things. One is there is a misperception that every business is subject to this. Um, Ninety-six percent of Americans' businesses have less than 50 employees, and those people are totally exempt from the coverage uh, requirements under the, uh, under the uh, Affordable Care Act. Um, second is we have 
really focused our time trying to put guidance out to the business community. So there's this notion of you need to have 50 full-time equivalent uh, uh, employees um, in order for the provisions to kick in. And so there's obvious questions about, okay, what's a full-time equivalent? What if I have 49 and then it goes to 50? What if somebody went from full-time to part-time? We've tried just to be very responsive. And so we have a look back that says you can look back a year and say, what did it look like the last year? And then you get a safe harbor for the next year so that people aren't going to continually be having to wrestle with this. And so, you know, in the Affordable Care Act, but also really in any time there's a major tax provision that's going to affect businesses, um, we have extensive dialogue with the business community. And what we try to do is make sure we put clear rules in place that will allow us to implement the law in the least burdensome manner possible to the business community. Commissioner, uh, as you mentioned earlier, the IRS will be involved in distributing billions of dollars in premium tax credits for people buying insurance in the exchange and administering the minimum essential coverage provisions of the Affordable Care Act. Therefore, the IRS will be in the position of verifying information provided by third parties, such as insurers. Can you tell us a little bit about your real-time tax initiative, and, and was it, what is it, and when does it begin? Um, so I guess two separate things. Yes, we are going to get information from insurance companies, information reporting, very similar to what we get from brokerage companies today, banks about uh, interest information and, and uh, you know, home ownership and, and int you know, interest information from there. Um, the real-time initiative is really something kind of a, apart and separate from this. Um, that's basically a concept that I've laid out that says um, a lot of the tax system runs um, after the fact, meaning people file, we then later match returns and we send them letters that we actually think we could have a much less burdensome system for the American people and one that actually led to better compliance as well if we could get information returns at the same time as the tax returns and any time there was any confusion, clear it up. Um, but it is really the real-time initiative that we have is something that is on a very different track. Um, it is something that is in, just in the discussion phases and we are getting lots of input and it is really very separate from you know, Affordable Care Act imp implementation. Well, I am going to, just as my just last question, um, the Chairman just asked you to look into the camera and talk about something. Uh, I am going to ask you to look into the camera, too, and that is to, can you tell us, can you tell the American people whether you feel comfortable that you are going to be able to do what is required of you, uh, your agency, that is, under the Affordable Care Act? Do you feel comfortable, assuming that you get the resources, I am sure? Yeah. No, we, uh, we feel very comfortable that uh, what the part of the Affordable Care Act, which is in the Internal Revenue Code, which we are responsible for, that it will be implemented well, it will be implemented on time, and people have my personal commitment and the agency's broad commitment that we will do it in a way that minimizes burden on business and individuals and respects taxpayer rights and tries to facilitate a, you know, a very good flow uh, of information. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, for, for the third round, uh, we'd like to go back to the exchange rule a little bit. Um, and I can understand your confidence when essentially the IRS was given unprecedented power in this case to basically rewrite a rule and bypass Congress as it has in this case. So I guess maybe it would be easier to be confident if I knew that I didn't have to go through Congress anymore. I can just kind of make it up as I go. But uh, can you specify the exact language that says the subsidies go to exchanges created by the Federal Government? Um, so, so a couple of things. First on your comment, um, we exercise the rule writing authority that is delegated to the Secretary of the Treasury in every tax bill, and that is what we did. And there is actually a process in this country that allows Congress to write the laws. We interpret them through rule and implement them, and if there is a disagreement, there is always the courts. And so I don't think we have any special power under the Affordable Care Act that, um, 
that uh, we, we don't have any time that we do rule writing. Um, I, I think, um, you know, I'm happy to, uh, Section 1321 talks about the uh, federal government will stand in for the state at times. Section 1401 okay, well, stop there. talks it's, about it. says it may stand in, but it doesn't say it can issue tax credit, uh, premium tax credits, and it can't uh, imply the uh, tax against the employers. It doesn't say that, does it? Section 1401, the second site you were asking for, is um, saying that uh, each exchange, and explicitly references the Federal exchange, shall report information to the IRS uh, regarding the premium credits that it pays. And so I very much agree with you that there is some contradictory language. Um, our lawyer's job is to say, taken in totality, you are not um, agreeing with me. I don't think it is ambiguous, best. sir. I don't think it is ambiguous. I think it is very clear. I think you are trying to twist it because you have to cover a gro gross uh, misinterpretation that the states would set up exchanges so that right now, to save this law, they couldn't save it the proper way by going to conference. They couldn't do that because Scott Brown was coming in and it was all going to fall apart. So they had to pass an imperfect bill, as Nancy Pelosi shared with all of us those famous words, we have to pass the bill to see what's in it. Uh, they, they had to pass an imperfect bill. So now when the states didn't set up the exchanges, we are having to go back around and try to find reasons for you to make this rule to include the Federal exchanges, which they, didn't they did not intend to include. They wanted to force the states to do this. When the states didn't do it, now we have this problem that we are here talking about today. Uh, you know, who initiated the rule uh, for the for the exchange rule? Did, uh, did the did the rule initiate at IRS or at the Treasury? Um, the way our rule writing works is that lawyers uh, at the IRS um, look at rule look at statutes, come up with their best interpretation. Um, I have to sign off on rules, as does the Assistant Secretary of Tax Policy. How many times did you meet with the Treasury to discuss this rule? Excuse me? How many times did you meet with the Treasury to discuss um, this rule? I meet with um, the Treasury Department of Tax Policy and their leadership on a regular basis. I have no idea how many times we actually talked about this rule. We talk about a lot of things. The tax code is very big and very okay. uh, complex. It, it is, and it needs to be reformed. Was there any pressure from the Treasury Department to issue a rule that went beyond the statutory authorization? I never felt any pressure on this rule. You know, my judgment on the rule was based on uh, speaking with our lawyers and, and coming up with what we thought was the correct legal reading. Okay. Have you ever done anything like this before? Excuse me? Have you ever done something like this before? Um, the Commissioner of Internal Revenue Service is continually uh, consulting with the lawyers of the Internal Revenue Service and putting out regulations to interpret statutes. This is it's a major part of the job. Okay, Mr. Truman. And, and I know you're, you're just trying to do your job. I will uh, just close with one last question. Uh, the IRS will be responsible for collecting thousands of dollars from employers uh, under the employer mandate. If the IRS makes mistakes, how can employers protect themselves from having to pay hundreds of thousands of dollars in error? Um, you know, we, uh, we have uh, very laid out traditional administrative processes. And so, you know, if, if we think somebody owes more taxes, first thing we do is try to work with them. If they disagree, they have, you know, very established appeals rights to supervisors. Then there is actually an administrative appeals process, our Office of Appeals, and then there is always uh, the courts. And so there is a lot of avenues for people to disagree with us, and that is you know, part, of, part of this country. Okay. So you are saying that uh, the plans uh, for an appeal process for employers is already in place? It will be um, you know, plans that we have. Uh, you know, it is not plans. It is procedures that we have in place, long established procedures to make sure the tax code is administered in a fair and even-handed manner. So, so we don't really know how employers will be able to appeal their penalties at this point? Um, if a penalty is assessed, um, most people voluntarily play, pay. If they disagree, um, whoever made the determination for the assessment, they can always talk with their supervisor. And there's, those processes are well enunciated in the Internal Revenue Manual. Um, 
They can then go to our appeals function, which is an independent function, much like an administrative court inside the IRS. And if they still disagree after those two steps, they can go to the courts. Okay. Uh, identity, uh, identity theft is a big problem, and information sharing in Obamacare makes it worse. Uh, that, that's a report that just came out from the IRS today. That's incorrect. Um, identity theft is a problem in this country, but there's no, never been an allegation that there's a problem with information for identity theft coming from the IRS. Okay. Well, this is the, the, the text from the uh, a ruling issued today in a new a report. In a new report to be issued Thursday, the Inspector General for the IRS says that tax thieves are stealing the identities of taxpayers and filing bogus returns on their behalf and collecting fraudulent refunds as a result. That's about $21 billion in fraudulent tax refunds over the next five years. Are you not aware of that? But I'm, I'm aware of that report, but I want to be very clear. People get their purse stolen in a mall. Someone has personal information and then they file a return with us. Or someone has access to an employer database and they steal information and file a return with us. There are no allegations in that report or other places that information is being taken out of the IRS for identity, uh, for identity theft purposes. And yeah. that, I would further, I have read that report. Okay. That report is very clear that the problems with identity theft mostly are systemic, and there's a variety of things that we've asked Congress to do to give us powers that, that haven't passed. Okay. So you don't think it's possible that with all the new information you've got to collect regarding Obamacare that this problem could get worse? I, I think uh, collect, uh, connecting identity theft as a problem in this country and the Affordable Care Act would be totally irresponsible to connect those two. Interesting. All right. Well, I tell you what, um, uh, thank you very much for your testimony and uh, your patience in going through three rounds of questioning. I, I, I would like to thank all of our witnesses today for taking time from their busy schedules to appear before us today, and uh, the committee stands adjourned.